Hello, I am Tamara Sweeney. And I'm Dr. Leanne Cozio. And this is Jurassic Justice. Today, we are very privileged to have a professor from St. John's University who traveled here all the way from New York. His name is Professor Anthony Pappas. Yes, and today's segment is going to be about the endless divorce. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to relate my experiences in the divorce courts of New York. Welcome, Professor. We're happy to have you here. Um, and the, as Tamara indicated, we're calling this segment Endless Divorce. I guess after we've reviewed your very extensive files, um, I guess that's what grabs us first. Amazing 12 years. Could you even contemplate 12-year divorce, what it would cost, what it would do to your family? What it would do to everything in your, 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 your personal and, and business life. Well, Tony has experienced just about everything a person could go through in a divorce. And we have found it to be a, a, one of the most shocking cases we've come across. Uh, Tony, how did it get to 12 years? Uh, well, after uh, 22 years of uh, marriage, uh, my wife filed for divorce in December of 2004. Uh, the children were at an age where the issues of uh, custody and visitation did not come up. Uh, the main issue was uh, equitable distribution of uh, the marital assets. But uh, what happened is that uh, I encountered uh, what I call the uh, trifecta of judicial bullies, and uh, that's the uh, reason why the divorce has taken 12 years and it's uh, still ongoing. I like that trifecta word. <laughs> trifecta, that is. Uh, it's not, we're not talking about the horse race, right, Tony? <laughs> um, we, uh, three of the, why don't you tell us um, who these three judges are, and maybe we can go over what each of them did to cause this 12-year disaster that they still seem to call a divorce. Uh, the first judge is who, oh, Dr. Uh, well, I wish it were uh, uh, talking about a horse race. Uh, you could probably characterize it as a judicial lynching. And the uh, first uh, judge uh, that was primarily involved was uh, Judge Stanley uh, Gartenstein. And uh, he started the process of uh, uh, taking testimony and looking at evidence about the uh, marital assets. And I uh, concluded uh, after uh, uh, many sessions that uh, he wasn't going to be fair. And uh, I uh, wrote a letter to him which uh, in the court system is uh, referred to as an ex parte uh, yes. communication. And uh, Judge Gartenstein uh, went uh, ballistic with that. So uh, what he did on uh, the next uh, court uh, appearance uh, in a small uh, hearing room, which is about the size of a large living room, is he stationed two court officers uh, next to me. And uh, when I wanted to take uh, my uh, glasses out of my uh, jacket pocket to put them on, he yelled at me and said, keep your hands on the table where I can see them. Well, that's how they treat you in the courtroom. See, Tony, you don't have any criminal record, do you? You're, you're a professor. You're a very uh, esteemed member of a, of a great university campus. Um, what would prompt him to even make statements like that? It sounds to me like he was characterizing you as something short of a terrorist, am I right? Uh, well, uh, at, at this point, he was, I think he was trying to uh, intimidate me by uh, having uh, the court officers and uh, telling me, uh, you know, keep your hands on the table where I can see them. Uh, everybody goes through metal detectors to go right. into the court, so it's not as if you have some uh, concealed uh, weapon on you, uh, so there was no reason for him to uh, do that. Uh, uh, in, in, well, you know uh, the real reason why he did that is because those ex parte communications, so now he's kind of one up in you, uh, telling you who's in charge. Uh, well, true he is. <laughs> uh, he uh, seems to have uh, uh, taken a different uh, perspective in a day or two because he uh, sent out a letter uh, to uh, everyone, uh, all the parties, saying, uh, in view of what happened in the court, I would uh, like you all to uh, uh, agree that uh, the uh, trial will continue and uh, you agree to my further involvement in the trial, uh, referring to himself. So he's trying to say he was 
that he was he had concerns about his own impartiality, right? Uh, right, and how he treated me when he said you can't take uh, your glasses and put them on to uh, you know read what uh, you're uh, talking about. Uh, so uh, naturally, I responded to his letter and said, uh, "No, I do not consent to your continued involvement in this case." And uh, then he reneged on his written offer to recuse himself. So he stayed on your case. Uh, right, he stayed on my case against your consent. Uh, against my consent, right? And uh, wow. he offered, he offered this by himself. You know, uh, if you want me to continue to preside. I need uh, your agreement uh, that you want that to be the situation. And I said, no, I don't. Uh, all right, so we continue testifying about uh, marital assets and separate property. And uh, then uh, uh, a year later, he came out uh, with a decision. And it was in this decision that he uh, you know, referred to me as a terrorist. Wow. Yeah. How did he do that, Tom? Uh, well, he basically... Uh, compared me uh, to the uh, person who committed the massacre at Fort Hood, te Texas. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so he wrote, uh, I allegedly made uh, thinly veiled threats in the idiom used by the perpetrator of the Fort Hood massacre. Wow. Yeah, now we all know at uh, Fort Hood, Texas, uh, Nidal Hassan fired over 200 rounds. <laughs> He killed 13 soldiers and wounded 32. Sergeant Francesca Velez was uh, pregnant when she was killed. Uh, the baby died in her womb. It was a terrible, uh, you know, tragedy yeah. uh, for yeah. our country, That's for the lot. United States. So he's comparing me to the Fort Hood massacre and writing wow. that he referred the threats to the Judicial Threats Unit in the Office of Court Administration. My gosh, Hammer. And he's They're trying to your set home. Him up. I know. in your home. Are you scared? Did you check him before you came in? You he did. He went you don't have any weapons. You have no way. No permits. Nothing, right? I put him through the metal detector. Did you? Yes, I did. <laughs> okay. Wow, Tony, is this for real? Is this, I, I, you know what? I have to say to the people, to the viewers out there, I have read his record, and I have seen it. He's not making this up. This actually happened. You will find it on the court records of uh, State Supreme Court in New York, um, Nassau County, correct? Uh, correct. Then uh, Gartenstein, in the same decision, uh, made another slanderous accusation. Uh, he wrote that I committed a violent Class B felony. How do you do that? Uh, well, Class B felonies, let me explain. Uh, they're something like a manslaughter, where somebody gets killed, or arson, rape, sodomy. Uh, mine was as follows. I punched my wife, fractured her face. She had reconstructive surgery with anesthesia. It cost about $9,000, and she charged it on a credit card. So that's what Garnstein is writing as, uh, you know, factual uh, happenings, uh, factual events. Were there any the records? records? Yeah, yeah, there's no evidence of this? or uh, well, There's a mandatory reporting here for something like that. Uh, correct. So when uh, somebody goes to the hospital with an injury, uh, you can't just say, well, I have a bullet wound and uh, I don't know how it happened, uh, you know, or uh, I walked into the tree and I fractured my face. Nothing faces me anymore. Right. Uh, you know, at the, at the hospital itself, Usually there's a police officer in the emergency room because people come in with serious injuries that uh, should require some kind of investigation. You know, how did this person get stabbed? How did this uh, person get a fractured face? How did this person get a bullet wound? And as a former criminal court judge, Gordonstein should be aware of this. That's right. So somehow he's writing that uh, during the divorce case, uh, you know, several years earlier, as the divorce was proceeding, uh, maybe this uh, Class B felony occurred. I wasn't indicted, I wasn't prosecuted, uh, but he's uh, writing uh, based on uh, false testimony from my wife that this is a factual and it's, uh, you know, part of what I call the judicial uh, lynching. Tony, uh, or should I say, Tammy, you've, uh, you, you've put out some messages. You've actually turned this into a reform effort of sorts. You have decided that you weren't, that you weren't getting, getting any remedy or recourse for this sort of you know, serial mistreatment, we could call it, 
And so you started going off and, and, and contacting authorities. You started uh, going amongst the people at the, the campus and out in the community and rallies and getting on the internet to, to expose this, 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 this misconduct and corruption. I, I know, Tamara, you've gone through some of this stuff, and maybe we can move on to the second judge in this trifecta. Did you, what did, did you find interesting in what your Yes, reading? your second judge, you said, is that Judge Anthony Falanga? Am I saying that right? right? Falanga. Okay. What really piqued my interest is this, uh, as you call it, the moral of the story. Can I just read this? I'm just going to read it. Really? It says, um, as a judge, I'm aware of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which guarantees freedom of speech and expression. But as a judge, I don't have to respect it. So what did you mean by that? Uh, well, what happened here is that uh, uh, I appeared uh, in uh, open court before Judge uh, Falanga. Uh, the reason he uh, took the case is that uh, Gartenstein uh, uh, recused himself uh, voluntarily. So Which one, he should. Uh, yeah, well, you think? <laughs> it, uh, it, uh, it partially resulted from my efforts because uh, Good job. Uh, once I got uh, his uh, decision about being a terrorist and having uh, fractured my ex-wife's face, I was dumbfounded. So I thought about it. So uh, eventually I went to the Nassau County District Attorney, uh, gave him the uh, decision by Gartenstein and pointed out that he's writing, I committed this uh, felony. And uh, here I was in their office. Uh, maybe they should arrest me because that you, was a crime. You were asking to be prosecuted. Right. I don't think I've ever heard that one before. Yeah. But that was bold. That's a that's a heck of a statement of uh, it is. of of of, 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 of your, your your protest to the mistreatment. I, I have to commend you that. I've never heard anything like that before. Uh, so what right. happened? Uh, well, the you're still here. Well, he's pulling up to the carpet like you yeah. know. I committed a felony. Let's go. I like it's it. I like it. it. Don't you? Well, I do. The, uh, they started the witch hunt. Uh, now yeah. you're trying. Well, the person at the Nassau County District Attorney, his office and assistant district attorney, you know, she uh, looked at her computer, you know, checked her records. So she said, uh, "Well, if that had happened, Mr. Pappas, we would have arrested you and indicted you. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're not believing it." And, wow. uh, and uh, uh, you know, then I uh, I also mentioned to her that he wrote I was a terrorist, and uh, to follow up on it, I went to the United States Attorney, because wow. uh, the U.S. Attorney is supposed to deal with uh, yes. terrorist uh, threats. Uh, at that time, the uh, U.S. Attorney in uh, Brooklyn for the uh, Eastern District of New York was uh, Loretta Lynch. So the current I, U.S. Attorney, by the way, go ahead. Right, she's the Attorney General now in uh, Washington. Uh, in 2010, she was uh, uh, the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District. Uh, so I went to the offices there, uh, 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 showed the officers at the metal detectors that uh, uh, here's the decision by Gartenstein claiming I'm a terrorist and uh, I committed a Class B felony and I wanted to see someone. So, you know, I wasn't running away, but uh, uh, here I am with this decision. So uh, I want to try to set the record straight. I wanted to see somebody uh, upstairs uh, about uh, this uh, crazy decision by Garden State. Uh, now, the way they reacted to that... I was going to say, what's their reaction? They have to be laughing behind the scenes. I mean... Well, at the... I, at the I'm really amazed. Yeah, well, at, at the metal detectors, uh, basically, their reaction was, uh, do you have an appointment? <laughs> so, I don't so need one. I, How about that? <laughs> yeah, so I told them, no. So I'm I'm security. Yeah. Yeah, right. So I told them, no, I don't have an appointment, but I'm frantic because Gornstein's writing. I'm a terrorist. You're trying to report yourself as a terrorist. Right. And I you want to test run. And they're say, still ignoring you. I, I'm familiar with this. I wrote a book about this. And, you know, the way we do that, we'll get to that some other time. Right. So, so it was like a... They just followed protocol. Uh, since you don't have an appointment, fill out a form. So no they way. gave me a form to fill out. Uh, it says, you know, why are you here? You know, labor law, immigration law, social security, social security. <laughs> wow. Yeah. They didn't have a box for terrorism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Especially with a judge, you know, that's got it on a record. Yeah. So I, it's a serious matter. I, 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 check, I, I checked the box other. You know, <laughs> and uh, then they let me uh, leave. You know, so uh, 
the moral of the story is uh, uh, see something, say something, uh, file a report, and get lost. <laughs> well, Tony, you were actually doing something else, were you not? Because now you're in front of Judge Falanga, your second judge, am I right? Uh, it was right. actually an earlier judge, but we're not dealing with uh, that. Yeah, these were the main right, ones. Right, the main ones. So, the, so and we're talking about a, a 12 year plus ongoing divorce. The second one is Judge Falanga. What you were actually doing, uh, of course, I understand it was with, with the earlier judge, but you continued this reform effort. Um, the second judge, this would be somewhere around uh, 2010 or 11, right? That's correct. He, um, if I read the papers correctly, issued a gag order on you, did he not? Uh, yes. Uh, so you were kind of violating this, were you not? Uh, right. Tell us about that. Uh, well, uh, he, he, he should have been aware that Gartenstein had uh, self recused himself, uh, but uh, uh, what he did is he blamed me for Gartenstein's self recusal and he's uh, writing down in some decision that uh, Anthony Pappas committed aberrant acts which uh, brought about the uh, recusal of uh, Wait, Gartenstein. Can you explain that? I've never even heard that term. Uh, well, uh, I refer to it as the Falanga Doctrine, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the, impl it's the implication is that if you're testifying before the judge, if you do something aberrant, you know, like thumb your nose, or do somersaults when you're giving testimony. Uh, that's aberrational, and then the judge will accommodate you and uh, get off the case. So he wrote that down. Uh, that's why Gartenstein recused himself. I committed aberrant acts. He went to Mark Twelve yeah. years. Yeah. Right, and then he uh, also issued an op a gag order in open court. Uh, you are not to complain to anybody inside the court system or outside the court system about how you feel or how you are being treated. Uh, if you feel I am violating your right to the First Amendment, uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And you have to, folks have to think about that for a minute. Let's say you were in court and some judge issued an order that you can't talk about anything. And, not even, and I saw in the transcript that particular order. He was ordering Professor Pappas not to communicate with anyone, not to report it, whether it be things he did with the Attorney General and, and the reform efforts. If you are being told by a judge not to communicate at all, and there's no public major interest that, that the judge could even cite, I didn't see any, um, i got to believe you'd think, wow, First Amendment, if that's, that's our self-governing society, that's our most important amendment. If you suppress and censor that, how will Professor Pappas tell his story, other than maybe in this program, and how are we ever going to get accountability in our justice system for these shocking things that you've only begun to hear? Go ahead, Senator. Uh, right, uh, we definitely need accountability. Uh, fortunately, uh, Judge Falanga retired uh, uh, after. Sure, sure. After. <laughs> so you're outliving all these uh, judges as your divorce yeah, continues. Uh, right. <laughs> Retirement. But, yeah. Uh, self recusal, whatever. Right. So uh, Gardenstein, uh, uh, Falanga retired. And uh, then the case uh, went to uh, Judge uh, Hope Schwartz uh, Zimmerman, so I could complete the trifecta of uh, judicial uh, bullies. Lynching. So, uh, right, the uh, judicial uh, lynching and uh, abuse of uh, uh, a litigant and violating due right, uh, due process and equal protection and other constitutional now, judge, rights. Judge Hope Zimmerman, um, uh, she obviously had all the records going back at that point would be almost 10 years, right? Uh, eight years, something like that. Right. Um, she would have gotten all of that record, would have reviewed it. You would expect her to. She's going to know your case, right? It's right. still going. Did she make any mention in your deliberations before her or after that? And this is a state Supreme Court judge in New York, right? Uh, correct. Did she make any mention of those prior uh, unbelievable events that you've already you just told us. Uh, well, she declared a mistrial, uh, so the assumption is you're starting afresh, and uh, she's going to uh, comment based on uh, what appears uh, before her and uh, what is presented as uh, the facts. Starting fresh, right? Well, you're talking they about now. They can't talk uh, anything in the past at this point. Uh, well, you you can uh, re refer uh, a mistrial doesn't mean you ignore the past, uh, but uh, you select uh, what you want to do as you start the case all over again. 
So but we're talking about Judge Gartenstein, am I right? Because uh, right. Flanagan didn't really have a trial, or did he? Uh, no. Okay. Not. So we're going all the way back to the to the well, he would be like the second judge or third judge, whatever. But he the, the trifecta, the first judge, right? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, all right. So uh, uh, so for uh, Judge uh, Zimmerman, uh, there was uh, no uh, testimony regarding uh, terrorist uh, threats. Uh, in my mind, I figured well. Uh, you know, the you U.S. attorney up. didn't arrest me. I had gone to the FBI. I had gone to the New York Police Department. Uh, nobody had questioned me about terrorist uh, threats. There's no production order to bring you out of jail. No habeas corpus, nothing right. like that, because you right. never were in jail. Right. Uh, so uh, then, in terms of uh, the uh, fractured the face. Uh, again, the presumption was, well, uh, that was uh, nonsense and propaganda because uh, I hadn't been sent up to Attica State Prison, uh, oh, so yeah. it uh, w wasn't uh, you know, specifically uh, referred to in the trial before Zimmerman. Uh, but then when she uh, issued her uh, uh, you know, decision and order after trial, she is including all of uh, Gartenstein's uh, allegations about terrorism and a fractured face, and uh, she's repeating this uh, propaganda uh, to uh, justify her lynching and uh, her, uh, you know, persecution uh, of an innocent uh, person. So she's utilizing facts which are demonstrably false, or you know, any rational person can see, uh, you know, what Gartenstein wrote was nonsense, and he recused himself. Uh, a month after uh, writing them, so Zimmerman is uh, repeating them now as being uh, factually valid. You know, she's making no commentary. You know that this is uh, uh, this was false or uh, this didn't make uh, any sense, and uh, she proceeds to uh, add her own uh, uh, forms of uh, you know false narrative and uh, lies to uh, continue. Uh, trying to uh, you know persecute me and uh, you know take away uh, my assets. Tony, in the 12 plus years, this endless divorces we're calling it. How many judges have you had so far? Uh, well, they were the uh, three main ones. Uh, there were there were maybe two or three others uh, involved uh, peripherally at uh, you know various uh, points. Tamara, you had. Um how many judges do you, you, you I have? had one the whole entire time. Yeah, I can't even get her off my case. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried. For the record, I've got 38 <laughs> trial judges, but we're not going to go there. We've got only a limited period of time, and our special guest is uh, Professor Pappas. Um, Tamara, uh, we've got a man who has spent a few dollars on his case. You are yeah. familiar with that. You've spent some money yourself. Um, he's, he's topped me on this one. <laughs> you spent, I'll let you, you well, spent some two million dollars. Is that right? Uh, on attorney's fees? Uh, two million dollars. Correct. Well, it's not on lawyer fees. It's not only that. It is. I'm, I'm sitting here as you're talking, trying to picture myself. You are this professor at a university. You have to keep your head together. You have right. to be confident in what you believe in. And all these rumors are going. You know, being spread about you. I mean, the stress. I I, I don't even understand how you survive that. That stress alone could kill someone. Uh, I, I agree, and the it's, point I try to make in my reform efforts, you know, like suppose this happens to someone who doesn't have a high school education, or has doesn't understand how the legal system works, or doesn't or, have the means or the money right, to, or the person is an immigrant and uh, doesn't uh, understand the English language uh, very well. Uh, or, you know, this happens while other things are going on in uh, your life. Uh, you know, you have uh, uh, older relatives that pass away, or you have uh, other loved ones that have to go to the hospital, or, you know, your car breaks down and uh, you need to get towed and, you know, have repairs. Uh, all these things, uh, you know, create the stress, and uh, then you have to cope with all these uh, uh, false uh, narratives that uh, you're a terrorist, that uh, you committed a felony, and uh, you know the other uh, lies that uh, Zimmerman is writing to uh, justify taking away all of your separate property and uh, leaving you effectively uh, penniless and uh, you know with uh, zero 
uh, assets to your name. So let's deal with that for a second. I mean, let's just get for the viewers uh, some clarification here. There was no issue of custody, am I right? No issue of child support. Your Correct. children were already of age and out of college and everything else. This was simply a fight over his assets and money. Am I correct? Uh, yes. Twelve plus years, still ongoing, right? Correct. Any end in sight? Uh, not as far as I can tell. And We've got. So you've been in jail for twelve years. Somewhat like, like that, wouldn't you call it that? Sort of like a, 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 an intangible jail, but we're talking about millions of dollars in assets that they froze, right? Uh, correct. How are you surviving? Uh, well, uh, I'm uh, surviving the best I can. Uh, to some extent, you have to uh, ignore the uh, orders uh, that uh, tell you, uh, you know, not to utilize your funds uh, because you need them for legal expenses and you know for day-to-day -day expenses. So uh, you are, uh, you know, forced to just uh, disobey them, and uh, you know uh, that's what you got to do in order to uh, live. Uh, we know Bill Clinton disobeyed it when he walked into the court that he had no, you know, with the woman there, and uh, that certainly wasn't a, a necessity, as you know, this certainly is. You're trying to survive, right? Uh, correct. And uh, you know, you, uh, uh, as I say, uh, you have to uh, get the, up the energy to file motions, try to make appeals, uh, go to the appellate division. Uh, each of these uh, endeavors, uh, you know, requires effort or uh, some funds, depending on whether you're going to do it yourself or uh, through an attorney, or there are various fees for printing or whatever. Uh, so it's uh, an ongoing, uh, you know, process of uh, persecution. Uh, you know, when you have uh, a rope uh, around your neck, I and always say the noose. <laughs> you have the noose, and they're trying to uh, tighten it, and you are trying to uh, remove it. Uh, but uh, you're facing uh, people who aren't accountable. And it's uh, based on this uh, terrible decision by the United States Supreme Court uh, called uh, Stump v. Sparkman. It's a judicial uh, immunity case, right? Uh, the right. Supreme Court gave immunity to judges. They can do it maliciously even, and they can get away with it. you got no remedy at yeah. law. And uh, fortunately for the reform effort, the uh, case in which they uh, conferred immunity upon Judge uh, Stump is something terribly atrocious, which uh, shocks the conscience of anybody who uh, hears about it. So as I go about and tell people about it, they're like uh, totally taken aback, you know, that this happened in the United States, and this resulted in the immunity for Judge Stump. Tell me briefly, what was that, the facts in that case? Uh, all right, it was, uh, it was a case in Indiana. Uh, a, a mother went before Judge Stump. Uh, she didn't have parenting skills, so she told Judge Stump, my uh, daughter's now 15 years old, and she's hanging out with older men, she's not doing her homework, uh, I think you should uh, sterilize her. Uh, sterilizing meaning uh, make it so she can't have children. All right, so now <coughs> uh, Judge uh, Stump, uh, he doesn't hold the hearing, you know, to try to hear the other side or uh, to go through due process. Uh, he doesn't appoint an attorney for the 15-year-old girl because she's a minor and she should have an attorney to represent her interests. So he calls the girl in and tells her, uh, go to the hospital to have your appendix removed. Uh, so the girl says, all right, the judge telling me, go to the hospital to have your that appendix removed. That mother, I, I can't even... Uh, right. Uh, that poor child. Boggles the mind. Right? That just shows how a child trusts a parent. You know what I mean? They will always trust the parent. Even they're though good parents, parents and they're bad parents, and right. you know we're with the good ones, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the same is the same is true about the judge. You know, yeah. like, uh, yeah. uh, you know, a parent can't go to the judge and say, "Oh, my uh, son is uh, shoplifting candy bars. Oh, so amputate his uh, hands so uh, he can't uh, shoplift uh, like candy bars, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So continuing with what happened. Uh, the girl went to the hospital. Uh, the surgeons uh, removed uh, her fallopian tube, so they did a tubal ligation. Uh, she did not have a chance to appeal. A due process wasn't followed. Uh, she married a few years later because she didn't know what had happened. And then she realized she could not uh, conceive and have uh, children. So she began to try to find out why. 
and uh, she discovered uh, this bizarre uh, operation. So she tried to uh, sue uh, everybody involved, the judge of Stump, uh, the surgeon, the other people involved in the process. Uh, and the uh, district court, the federal district court, the, uh, uh, the case was dismissed. She took it to the Seventh Circuit where they sided with the girl. Her name was uh, uh, Linda K. Sparkman. Chicago. And uh, then from there, it uh, was somehow taken up to the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, even though the Supreme Court takes up less than 1% of the cases, right. they try to go to the Supreme Court. But apparently they must have thought, gee, the whole legal system is now going to collapse because uh, well, this uh, sure. judge now doesn't have immunity because uh, he removed the fallopian tubes of a 15-year-old girl. And uh, in a narrow 5-3 to three decision, uh, the Supreme Court uh, reversed the Seventh Circuit and uh, gave Judge Stump immunity. Uh, now again, three of the judges dissented uh, from that. So again, once again, uh, you know, they're five, wearing that robe. Yeah, five yeah. judges say this is the right thing, and the other three are saying, "Well, you don't know what you're doing. We disagree with you." Well, Tony, now that case, and that's a shocking case. I think we all agree. Um, but it's carried all the way up to the present day. I know from the work me and Hammer have been doing. We've been studying cases. Uh, we review cases, we expose misconduct, and we look at some of the ones that have been over the past few years occurring because of the stump ruling. I assume you know some of them. There's the case of Judge Wade McCree in Michigan, a very recent one. Based on the same immunity, here's a judge who is conducting a support hearing in the state of Michigan. The woman has an affair going on with him. It's secret access to chambers. You folks always wondered what goes on in chambers. Well, here's one incident, many more. In all my years as an attorney, in all my years as a parental rights advocate, we're talking better than quarter century, federal, state courts, communities all across the country. Uh, unbelievable things will go on. In this case, this judge was having an affair. He's a married man having an affair in chambers with the mother in a support case that's pending in front of him. He puts the father on a tether, okay, to monitor him because he wants him to pay his child support, he's helping his lover, and then when it finally, she became pregnant, uh, and it was exposed, conflict occurred between the mistress and the judge's wife, not too uncommon, and the father, the victim of all of this, when the judge should have clearly stepped off the case, if anybody thinks there's not a bias issue there, wow, um, then you probably ought to stay out of any court. Um, so they took uh, an action against Judge Wade McCree, he was removed from the bench. Thank goodness for the Michigan court system for that. But the father clearly had a cause of action. He brought the action in federal court in the same procedure that Professor Pappas has just described, went all the way up to the Supreme Court, which refused to hear the case. And as a result, the, uh, uh, the, the Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, the rulings below were held in place that that judge had absolute immunity and the victimized parent had no cause of action for damages. He just had to suck up all of that damage that he incurred over all those years. So that brings us up to the present. Judicial immunity is a real problem in this country. I know Tamara talked about her judge and, and, and the remedies that people should have. When we, we think of what has occurred in her case, for example, the shifting of a, of a major tax uh, a, a problem that her ex occurred over all those years to make it sound like it's her fault. In my case, a uh, whole variety of things affected my children, my license, and the retributions that I sustain, which I'll probably incur more just by being here and taking this risk by presenting you these, these sorts of claims. We, at this Jurassic Justice effort, this movement that we are calling Jurassic Justice, hope to get better accountability for folks like Professor Pappas and others, for Tamara, myself, we're all victims. We hope to help you as well. And in this reform effort, we hope to come to your communities, as we are doing. We hope to do videos for you and expose and do what the mainstream is not doing. A documentary on uh, court corruption uh, and parental abuse in these courts, what I like to call child abuse as well by the system, needs accountability. It's not occurring. I think we can all agree. I know you filed complaints. You mm -hmm. filed complaints. Absolutely. I know they, I filed complaints with our respective state judicial conduct commissions. Nothing is occurring. 
And if you can't sue the judge for damages and liability and responsibility, like the rest of us when we commit these sorts of tortious claims, then we have a very serious problem in this country because it really has become an epidemic. So we hope that you will um, contribute to our cause. We hope that you will uh, contact us and we'd be happy to uh, expose that sort of corruption and do what mainstream media should be doing. It is one of our efforts. Tamara, um, maybe you want to just uh, conclude and... Um, sure, I just want to thank Professor for coming out and telling his story today. It was a horrific one. I can't imagine having those false accusations on me. <laughs> I had some, but not that bad. Uh, but thank you for coming today. Um, I want to thank the audience. This was longer than normal, but um, we survived. It was well worth it, and we continue to do this. So please call us. Uh, you can contact me. My number is 215-601-3234. Dr. Number, Leon? There you go. 315-796-4000. Easy to remember. 315-796-4000. Uh, and until next time. We are Jurassic Justice. Thank you thank for being you. with us. Thank Have you. a good day. Very good, huh? I think you presented. Was there anything else you needed?